Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Engineering Tech Show. And here are your hosts, Goshi King and Joe Green. We're off. Hi. How are you doing, Goshi? I'm good. How are you? Oh, very well today. This didn't take long. If we could spit out uh, podcasts at this frequency, mm-hmm. we'd be famous real quick. <laughs> Two a day. <laughs> I guess the key is to have someone else do a lot of the work for one of them. Yeah. Be interviewed. And I'm almost grateful for an architecture for letting us uh, get back on track. Yeah, it is. Almost making us kind of revitalize our energy and yeah, give us a little kick. I feel like I'm a little more mo- motivated. Even yeah. though like summer is towards its end too, anyway. So I think we can get back into it now mm-hmm. and spend some time. But uh, the cold weather will thrive. Yeah. But you're right, it was almost inspiring to see how they run it and do one with them. Yeah. It was good. So what's this podcast about, Joe? This podcast is going to take a more in-depth look at the HVAC systems. What's an HVAC? A heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. My man. Something that keeps you nice and warm or cold and brings you fresh air, hopefully. Yeah. We're going to be blowing hot air. <laughs> <laughs> it will be a lot hot air, probably. That's our new tagline, guys. Our, we're engineering.tech, but our tagline is really blowing hot air because <laughs> we deal with air conditioning a lot. Um, so, yes, like uh, Joe, you mentioned, so we're going to get in depth, uh, but in light of COVID. That's yes. the whole thing it's about. So air conditioning for not necessarily residential, even though we will touch on that and see what measures residential uh, HVAC systems people can take to do that, uh, but more on a commercial, light commercial, industrial level, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Offices, schools, something like that. So what's the problem now? The problem now is that, well, I guess schools, people are going, everyone's going back. Not everyone. A lot of people are going back to their buildings, whether it's schools opening, offices opening back up. I guess that's about it. Any other building, people are returning. You might have sick people returning that don't know it. So I think that's a concern. How to mitigate issues, keep it clean, as clean as possible. Well, so let me roll back a little bit. The idea is the issue is for this for the purpose of this podcast is that okay COVID there's COVID out there, COVID spreads uh, through people breathing, coughing, sneezing, correct? Yeah, right. That's the assumption. Some people take it, take it to that literally. Okay, yeah, it's spreading through just breathing, normal breathing. Some people say no, it's more than that, and we kind of know the size of the particles for viruses, generally speaking. Uh, not you know not hundred percent, but we know some, right? Mm-hmm. And as far as I know, the size of the COVID virus is it's like the point around think, that one. I think one point six micron, something like that. Yeah, I think it's okay. one point. I, well, I th- th- yeah, I think you're right. Someone did say that, so it's because be as small as point something. Yeah, but um, the when you cough and sneeze, the average size of your uh, particles that come out of your mouth are roughly around 10 microns, 5 to 10 microns, even bigger sometimes, uh, 20 mm-hmm. microns. Um, and when you're breathing, an average person breathing, uh, the amount of stuff that comes out of their mouth, what I read on the internet, and if, I, if it's on the internet, it can't <laughs> be wrong, uh, is 0.1 micron. And a 0.1 micron is really, really, really small. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but but um, there are so the issue is that the virus is in the air. It's spreading, regardless of what you know what you believe about how it's spreading, right? What can we do to reduce the risk of spreading, right? And so there is this. Who's who? who what is Ashray Joe? It's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers. That's right. So what did they they come out with? A whole bunch of guidelines, correct? They have a lot of guidelines. I think for the last, this is August, last six months, seven months, they have been issuing updates and recommendations, guidelines for how you can, I guess, best deal, well, 
how you can deal with your air conditioning systems yeah to help you out i guess limit exposure yeah so before we get into and and then on our last podcast, we we talked a lot about you know different scenarios and you know beliefs and what it what the viruses are and how do they you know how are they spreading and so forth and and there were some new developments since then and then I kind of want to touch base on that real quick. Uh, one of the latest studies that come that have come out of um, I think it's from uh, University of Florida and there was an article published on the New York Times. It was called a smoking gun, infectious coronavirus retrieved, retrieved from uh, hospital air. And based on what they said in there is that, um, you know, they tested, they tried to collect the samples of this virus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were two patients, I think, that were COVID infected. Uh, and they had all the HVC measures intact. Mm. Okay. Uh, that included like six air changes, and we'll get into what six air changes is in a minute. We already have in the last, last podcast, but we'll we'll dive into it real quick here too. Then they also had upper room uh, ultraviolet um, germicidal infectious um, uh, infection. Did I say right? UVGI. What does I stand for? Ult- ultraviolet germicidal whatever, <laughs> yeah. uh, device that was also installed in the room and uh, and they tested, so they were trying to capture the virus and within uh, just a little over two hours, within three hours, they were able to capture the first, uh, there are two samples. One was captured at six feet from the patient and the other one was captured at 14 feet from the uh, patient. And you have to realize that the hospital room that was tested in the hospital room, they're designed for you know reducing the the risks uh, involved with spread of, you know, bacterial and viral diseases. Mm -hmm. Correct, Joe? Yeah. So uh, long story short, it is my belief now, uh, based on that study and a couple other that we mentioned, we talked about with Joe Brosho and Tim Brosho, is that this virus is not really, it's it's not not stoppable, essentially. It's going to spread. Viruses are going to virus. Yep. Yeah, once it's in a building... I mean, and somebody has it, everywhere. your masks aren't really going to be all that effective. And I don't want to get into the whole mask discussion, whether, you know, masks are good for what or whatnot, okay? Uh, yeah, there are plenty of evidence out there that your regular cloth masks or, you know, like surgical masks, if you blow them up in the, under the microscope, you know, standard optical microscope, uh, a few dozen of 1.1 microns, microns can pass through the threats there's the openings are wide open for uh, for them to allow so if you if someone has it the mass ain't going to do much yes when they're you know when they're uh coughing and and sneezing all the bigger particles that we mentioned like 10 microns or 20 microns are likely get ca- caught in those mm-hmm. uh but that's pretty much it that's all you're getting so there is if you think if you, if, in my opinion, again, it's my opinion. Take me to the bank. I'll talk with you as long as you want me to. But those masks are not going to prevent spread of coronavirus. Period. That's my opinion. So moving on. Um, so uh, back to the. Just trying to. I'm trying to wrap it up so I can like sort of like get a you know start a handle on a direction of what we want to take this podcast to and that is covid is spreading how do we stop it from spreading in or reduce the risk of spreading the coronavirus in a building with air conditioning systems yes yep you're trying to reduce that exposure and what it and then ashray as joe had already mentioned has come out with different guidelines so there are a few guidelines, right, Joe? Like there are guidelines for schools and they have schools. I saw they just recently they came out with one for polling places. I guess in light of the elections coming up, yeah, they're preparing for that. Yeah, and I w- I would assume that they're going to do a lot of social distancing on that. You know, there'll be markings on the floor, and yeah, you know, the boots will be far away from each other, mm-hmm. and so forth. You know, and if there is a staff, it might be behind. You know, Pexi glass or whatever. Yeah, right. I assume they'll be more separated or have some dividers. Yeah, 
I'm sure they'll... As far as I know, it's still just a one-day activity. Correct. So, so it, you can. So you take the school, right? Yeah. The same example of a school or even an example of a uh, polling station. And you can integrate it to any type of building, any commercial, you know, multi-users type of building. Correct, Joe? Yeah. HVAC systems, I mean, other than one might be more typical in different applications, but an HV, like a HVAC system, the same one in a school, in an office, they'll all operate the same. It doesn't matter what type of building they're in. Good. So the, just the, the, the point to reiterate before we get into nitty gritty of this is that this podcast is about, you know, a modifying or reevaluating your existing or new air handling systems, air conditioning systems, heating or cooling air conditioning systems, and or uh, to figure out how to reduce the risk. And and disc- disclaimer, it's not, this our guide is just a general guideline, right, Joe? It's not going to be applicable to everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you will try and educate you as best as possible, but we will not teach you everything that you need to know. It's impossible to do it in a podcast, to be honest yeah. with you. It takes hours and hours of you know study. The, and the reason why is because the air handling systems are not the same. They vary. Like there is mag- magnitude of the, 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 the there, there is just so many ways even though one type of system can serve a building. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to just give you a small, short list... You could have a single zone variable air volume system. You have a multi zone variable air volume. Correct. You could have uh, things like dedicated outside air systems. You have something like a dedicated outside air, and then put fan coils on the end of it. Yeah. So you have it's a mix. It's like a hybrid system where you have a, uh, a dedicated outside air system with fan coil unit system. It can't. It, it doesn't even have to be just fan coil system. It could also be. Things like chill beams, air, you know, passive or active chill beam system, right, yeah. Joe? Yeah. And then on top of that, it could also be that you have natural ventilation in the building. You don't, and but you have other heating and air conditioning systems that are local to each room or each zone within a building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we see a lot of just natural ventilation, which is operable windows, and then some sort of radiation, some hot water radiation underneath it. Yes. Common in our area too. Right. Uh, the uh, uh, And then you can also have things like uh, 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 variable uh, refrigerant volume systems, also known as what, Joe? Well, you have VRF and then VRV, v, yeah. so either volume or flow. Yeah. So and they're essentially the same, just different manufacturers yeah. call them different things. Well, proprietary. <laughs> yeah. Terms. So those are refrigerant-based systems, air conditioning systems, and they usually do not have ventilation part to them. Yeah. I know a lot of uh, older hospitals will have dual duct systems where they have one duct system that's hot air, one that's cold air. Yes. And then they mix it locally. Yeah. So the point of the point of going down a, a short list like that is to to just to show you the complexity of an air conditioning system that can exist in, within one building. It could be multiple different types of systems based on the type of you know, spaces it uses. You could have a whole bunch of different systems that, and so each, the, so, so to apply COVID or virus or bacterial uh, you know, uh, 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 measures, you would need to do different things to different mm-hmm. um, uh, systems. Correct, Joe? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, too. I mean, schools, especially older schools that have had additions and renovations, you can have a whole gambit. You might have, I don't know, three or four or five different systems in one building. So American Society of Heating and Air Conditioning Engineers has come out and, you know, uh, uh, sort of provided a general guideline, and it's actually pretty in-depth guidelines that you can download for free. Uh, but it, but all in all, they've also said that you need professional engineers to evaluate your specific systems, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what we were gonna say. You know, if you have, if you're looking for, uh, we're trying to give you like a general knowledge so that when you, when you do hire someone to evaluate your systems, then you know you already understand, uh, you know what are the things that are involved, 
and you may you know with the help of this you may be able to ask the right questions yep yeah you could own the building you could be a parent with kids going to school any of that stuff just providing you with the knowledge yeah and and a, a lot of stuff that we're talking about we're going to put it in the show notes so it will be linked in our show notes you're going to be able to click on them read on them uh, if you or if you're working and you don't have a whole lot of time to read on them, just download a plugin that can read through PDFs or websites, so that you can just you know sort of plug in uh, worst case scenario. And if you do have time to read, read through them. Uh, but uh, uh, um, w- you could spend a long time <laughs> reading all this, all the various information. Yeah, and you too. know, and some of the, some of that, it you know, it would it it it's not necessarily that you want to go that route because professionals will do that for you mm-hmm. uh but if you you're you know more technical oriented then why not right might might strike a passion yeah, yeah. um so how, how do you want to dive into this joe like do you want to so i think what i want to say joe and you correct me if i'm wrong i feel like there are two components to this measure if you're going to do a covid measure to your building you have uh, filtration system upgrades or maintenance, and then you have controls and sequences. Yeah, right. And yeah. then it, the 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 filtration system is a broader term because it can encapsulate a whole bunch of things that we're about to talk about. You kind of yeah, like your air side side of I guess your air side part, and then the whole smart control part. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so let's uh. First of all, we did say that we we're going to help people understand air change yeah. per hour. So there are a few terms that we're going to be using. Air change rate uh, per hour. We're also going to be talking about CFM. Mm-hmm. And um, what else? Those are probably the most common big ones, ones, I would yeah. say. So CFM means cubic feet per minute. Mm-hmm. But cubic feet per minute of what? It's out of dry air. Blowing hot air, Joe. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hot, hot air, cold air. That's uh, uh, cubic feet. Think of it this way: it's a cube, uh, or or a, or, a, or you know, um, uh, imagine it's a one foot or twelve inches by twelve inches cube, mm-hmm. right? And that's one cubic feet. And the amount of air that moves through that cube within one minute right mm-hmm. would be one cfm yep and but rooms are usually not that small you rooms are you know a hundred by a, a hundred square feet by uh what is it joe is it if it's a hundred by a hundred ten thousand by ten ten um hundred feet is a lot isn't it yeah, that's a pretty big space. Yeah, so it's 100,000 cubic feet of uh, volume in that space, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the CFM will be that much. CFM will be a lot less than that, you know, somewhere between two um, air changes to 10 or something, Yeah. right? Um, so air change, let's talk about the air change. Yep. What is air change? So air change, it's basically telling you how many times an hour you are re- in an ideal situation, replacing that volume of air. So if you have, let's make the math easy, six air changes per hour. If you take 60 divided by six, that means every 10 minutes you are replacing the air in your room with new air. That's right. So you can kind of get an idea of what your turnover rate is. So maybe it's all the same turnover, air change per hour. Um, yeah, and that's uh, so. Those those are the two things that defined, you know, that we're going to be repetitively using in this uh, um, in this podcast. So, uh, what do you want to start first, uh, 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 Joe? Do you want to start with controls, or do you want to start with filtration measure first? Maybe so start on the air side. Air side, okay. That is, um, I think one thing too. So your air change per hour is just your CFM times 60, so you get that minutes to hours, and then divided by your volume of the space. So it is a pretty simple math if you know your CFM and volume. So I think it's 
uh, important to sort of like, you know, uh, also mention that the air handling, the type of air handling systems vary, right? Um, even in the physical size. Sometimes you'd see air handling systems that are sitting on the roof or outside the building. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're inside the building. But generally, all of them, if they're central air handling systems, which those will be, will have filtration system in them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes f number of filters, uh, filter banks can be multiple. Sometimes they'll have one, sometimes they'll have two. Most common is two filters. One is on the supply set or fresh air comes in and then uh, and, uh, there is a filter there before it gets to the inners of the air handling system. Mm -hmm. So it would block all the de dust and debris and bacteria and viruses, technically uh, speaking. And then on the air that's going into the room now is already filtered. And then there's air that's coming back from the room. And leaving the air handler with the help of a fan will may have a filter. And that's not going to be as, as robust of a filter oftentimes than the one that was installed for the fresh air. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll have a third bank of filter, which will be the, f the first two that we talked about. But then this bank of filter will be after the room the air that's coming back from the room and the air that's coming from the outside is mixed together and then it's now going through another bank of filter that also happens sometimes mm -hmm. um so on the air side the number first number one thing that ashray one of the number one most important things ashray men mentions is to improve those filters if you can or constantly replace them have a have a schedule uh, that the uh, facilities or you yourself as a as a building responsible for building HVAC system is constantly maintaining them. So you every three months you're swapping all the filters with new ones. Correct, Joe? Yeah, I think it's something. You know, higher quality filters can probably go longer than cheap quality filters. Yes, I think it's just yeah. You're right though. You do need a plan, so you remember every so many months to go down and do it. I think newer buildings, especially the ones that we do, you'll have a pressure sensor over the filter to tell when it's gotten more full and it can be loaded up. So you can kind of have smart controls that tell you when to go change your filter. But otherwise it is just writing it down on paper and making a little calendar appointment to go change it. Correct. If you wait too long, it just increases your fan energy because there's a lot more gunk on your filter you have to push through and it's not as effective yeah and one of the things i want to mention is that the ashray guideline that came out for especially for schools mm -hmm. is not just talking about filters and air handling systems it's talking about all kinds of things it's talking about if you have a school or a building you want to create a committee that's COVID committee you know they use different name for it but you know for the sake of conversation let's just say it's a COVID committee and then they're saying that you've got to have social distancing. You have to do like hundreds of things to make it work. One of them is, you know, uh, social dis distancing, right? Mm -hmm. Reducing the occupancy in, in smaller spaces, keeping everybody six feet apart, uh, cleaning, sanitization, availability of masks and gloves and you know, wipes, like disinfecting wipes, right? Uh, antibacterial hand soaps, things like that, right? And they're also talking about, um, you know, how to operate a facility, how early to start, how late to close, how run long to run your air handling systems. So we'll get into that when we get, to get into controls. And then they're also talking about the filters, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk about a little bit about, I've got this chart open. Uh, about the MER filters uh, and and their effectiveness when it comes to viruses. Yeah. So let's touch base on that real quick before we dive into what do you need to do for your air handlers and how what how how to replace them, right? Mm -hmm. And what are the caveats when it comes to that? So this chart is um, I believe it's published by um, Ashray, maybe not, but this this it's this this chart is about uh, filter effect percentage effectiveness. And the way it's uh, created is that it's it talks about the size of the microns. So we know that most viruses live between 0.3 micron to like 2 micron. That's a general 
consensus on the size of the the viruses. Bacterias are usually a little larger. The size of the bacteria is larger. So what they did is, is they created a category of 0.3 to 1.0 micron. The next one was from 1 micron to 3 micron. And the third one was from 3 to 10 micron. And if you looked at these filters, they're you know, if you ever ha happen to come across a filter that's installed in an HVAC system, and most of them you would find that they're MERV rating, M-E-R-V. Do you remember what that stands for? It's something like the mean efficiency rating value. Thank I'm you guessing. for that. I'm uh, not 100% what the V is. Yeah, I think it's, I think you're you're pretty close to what you just said. Um, the, uh, so it starts from 8 all the way to 16. For, for HVAC standards. So that's a good standard for, uh, at least in America, what you what kind of filters you would want to have in your in your air handling systems. They would You would not want, and we, most engineers, I don't know, I've been in this industry since 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, I have not used anything less than MERV-8. I think that would probably be like your low quality, not low quality, but more residential, um, older systems, hotels. I think those they won't. They would be just like a one-inch throwaway filters. Those would be. Those yeah. probably won't even be Merv Eight. No. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So we're talking about central air handlers, right? Like not really fan coil units or small, like you know, heat pump type of systems. Right. Yeah. So, so what they say is that, and I'm gonna just very quickly. So, most common ones. We're only gonna ta tackle three most common ones. Okay. Merv Eight, Merv Thirteen. Uh, I'm sorry, Merv Eleven and Merv Thirteen. Those are very common. So MERV-8 is not effective at all when it comes to 0.3 to 1.0 microns. It's it, The charts is not applicable. So essentially, if if you have a, a thing of that size, it's going right through it. And believe me, guys, when I say this, that your cloth masks and your, uh, your surgical masks are no better than MERV-8, probably worse than MERV-8. So... Anything that's between 0 0.3 micron to 1.0 micron is going right through. Influenza, by the way, is 0 0.9, my, I think 0 0.93 or 0 0.98. I'm, mm. I'm probably mixing the numbers now. But 0 0.9 something is the size of the uh, virus particle uh, when it comes to influenza. So useless, in my opinion, again. Uh, people are going to give me shit over this, but I don't care. Uh, so MERV-8 is about 20% effective when it comes to 1.0 to 3.0 microns, okay? And it's 70% uh, it's effective when it's 3.0 to 10 uh, microns. That's when you're like, you know, where you're talking, spitting, uh, or coughing, or uh, sneezing, that you start at like 5 micron and up, okay? So that's when your mask is effective, uh, maybe. That's even a maybe. I don't believe that. So let's jump to the next level of filter, which is MERV-11. And it's 20% effective for that 0.3 to 1.0 micron. So COVID is going right through it, guys. Don't even even bother with that. It's 65% effective from 1.0 to 3.0 microns. And it's 85% effective 3.0 to 10.0 microns. And the last one that I want to talk about is MERV-13, which is 50 percent effective from 0 0.3 to 1.0 micron and this is MERV 13s are robust they're better filters we recommend but they're not always used they're only used when there is a project called lead l-e-e-d so if you have a project a new building that's being built and you're looking for a lead certification now joe what does lead stand for question me with all these abbreviations uh sorry <laughs> putting I you in believe the spot. It's like leadership and uh Environmental efficient design or something of that yeah, nature. Yeah, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. Yeah, that's what that is. And uh, and so so oftentimes you know uh, you get government subsidies and credits or some sort if you're you're qualified. And if some state require it, like Massachusetts require you to make your buildings LEED certified at base even, but you know they require it. So anything that goes in Massachusetts now will have MERV thirteen filter. It's a lot. Of, yeah, their state projects or any state government project is. Thank you for bringing that up because I don't. I think private's not necessarily true, right? No. It's the state projects that. So if it's a university that's state run, yeah, uh, or if it's a train station that's you know state run, then it's gonna have to comply with that. Yeah. So MERV 13 
for 0.3 to 1.0 micron, it's 50% effective. So 50% of the viruses is more likely going to go right through. Uh, 1.0 to 3.0 is 85% effective, which is well a lot better than the previous ones. And then it's 90% effective from 3.0 to 10.0. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised how not good it is at the 0.3 to 1. I know. Uh, even MER 14, according to the filter efficiency chart, is only 75% effective. So, so what happens when MER 14 is introduced into the air handler, uh, Joe, where it was only designed for MERV 8, maybe? Well, it's going to filter out a lot more stuff. Yeah, but what does uh, it do to your air handling system? So I guess because it's a more robust filter, it has more media, you have to fight harder to push the air through it. I guess it would be a couple things. One is the filter is probably bigger than a MERV 8, so... It may not even fit. fit it might need yes. modifications. I think minimum is 4-inch. They don't make mm -hmm. the 2-inch MERV 14 filter. Yeah. So 4-inch, and then bag filters are up to 12-inch yeah. bags, which are very effective and you know washable and so forth. Yeah, it's kind of like the high-quality. High-quality filters, yeah. yeah. So those MERV 14, so when you say fight harder, you know, for, for, a, for a person who's a facility guy, what does that mean for them? Well, if, as far as that means is they'll, if they can fit it in, depending on how into their HVAC, HVAC systems they are, they might just replace it and not worry and walk away. But what that means for the air handler is that your fans are working harder to push air through that filter. That could mean either your fans are now operating, I don't know, this throwing out numbers, 20% more to get the same air or they're operating at about the same power, but you're getting less air. Correct. So if you just you can't just replace it and hope that everything works, it's, all hokey dokey. Now that everybody's familiar with you know like what you know, especially like good quality, uh, even face masks, right? You and I had that experience actually this Friday. I had a very fancy mask that because I went to this site where it was a lot of mold and asbestos, so I wanted to be protected. Yeah. So I put this mask on. I had a little steel on top. And I pinched the steel around my nose so I wouldn't be able to breathe air. So, And it made it so hard for me to breathe through that because the the thickness of that mask was very thick. Like it was, I don't even know where my wife got it from, but it was, and I was having difficulty breathing through it. I could not f breathe through my nose anymore. And I'm, I, I typically breathe through my nose. So I had to open up my mouth and like just push mm -hmm. air more. So my lungs were working harder because yeah. I, my the filter media that was blocking me, I needed more force to to blow through it, right? And I think everybody probably by now has experienced that scenario, unless they're just using the surgical mask. Then no, they have not. Um, so so that's what happens to the air handler. And if all they do is just replace the filters, then the fan is not is it's working the same speed as it was set it at, because it doesn't know that it's got a blockage. So it's just going to keep rotating the way it was designed, but the amount of air that will come out of that filter will be less. Mm -hmm. That means that the capacity, the cooling capacity has dropped or heating capacity has dropped, right? And the and if it's serving multiple spaces, multiple offices, multiple classrooms, multiple conference rooms, multiple residential rooms and whatnot, they're going to see less air and they're going to see decreased performance in heating and air conditioning yeah and so the remedy that you would need to get a tab contractor who's going to ramp up the fan if even if the fan is capable of doing that sometimes fans are already tabbed out on an older systems sometimes engineers do their due diligence and make sure that they you know have some safety factors in their fans so that the fans can be ramped up and for future expansions, for example, uh, VA jobs, government VA jobs, um, require the air handling systems to be s designed for 20% more additional capacity. Mm -hmm. That's a requirement by VA, like it's a, that's their standard. So in Army Corps of en Engineer jobs, you would see that they typically any federal government jobs will have a 20%, something like that. I, I could have a percentage off, but it's somewhere around there, 15 to 20% or maybe even 30%. So if they're sizing an air handler that only needs 10,000 cubic feet per minute air, they may size it to 12,500 or 13,000 so that if in the future expansion, if they need to add more, 
Mm -hmm. then they can add on to it. So that means the fan is sized to handle added pressure. Okay, so that will be a good thing. But in a lot of jobs, you'll see existing systems that are package units maybe. It may not be the case. Yeah, a lot of those are probably more limited from the get-go on what they can get. and You might be maxed out already. Yes. So... Long story short, uh, uh, we're going to try to wrap up the filter conversation. ASHRAE, American Society of Heating and Air Conditioning for Engineers, says improve your filters if you have MERV 8, to ch- turn them into higher MERV rating. Uh, well, even if you have 11 or 13, try to get to a MERV 14, and that, uh, that helps with uh, you know, mitigation of viruses and you know, reduces the risk of the spread. But like I said, like I said, the effectiveness is not 100%, and there's a whole lot of other factors that go into it, which we did discuss in our previous podcast. We're not going to get into that, especially like how people are seating and where air is moving about and how, uh, you know, air can, uh, uh, you know, affect someone that was sitting downstream of the airflow from the source. So if someone is sitting uh, in front of the classroom, but the return is in the back of the classroom, and they're affected and they're breathing or coughing or whatever, that air is moving backwards, and anybody in their passage is likely going to get contaminated. Okay. Yeah, they'll all be exposed. All be exposed, exactly. So um, so this is just one measure. All right, let's talk about other measures that ASHRAE recommends, Joe. So one thing that they, in their opening schools, reopening, they point out under the filtration is that if MERV-13 filters cannot be used, including when there is no mechanical ventilation of the space, portable HEPA air cleaners in occupied space may be considered. So what they're saying is if you have either like a landlocked room or you won't be opening up windows, you can buy a portable air cleaning device that will, at the very least, help remove some of the contaminants from your room it'll just keep recircling that same air so if i mean it's not changing it over it's just cleaning it out hopefully removing particles as it does it um yeah that's right and the other thing is that uh uh and i think i think what we we're gonna do is at at in our show notes we're going to th- uh you know just for um uh, uh, for the convenience of you guys, we'll actually list some pieces of equipment that are and filters and so forth, uh, filtration systems that you can uh, purchase. Um, well, you know, for uh, for for improving your uh, um, air quality in a in a in a space. Uh, so we'll probably throw in a couple of links for a good quality uh, HEPA filter systems mm-hmm. uh, and other other uh, measures like ionizers. And let's touch base on ionizers real quick, but uh, also like maybe upper room UVGI filtration systems and so forth. So, so uh, aside from uh, uh, having filters in a central air handling system, Joe, uh, you've touched base on a HEPA filter. And uh, let's just quickly go over what how good a HEPA filter system is. So I think they're, I don't know if they're from me, I think they're around like 99 point something percent effective at removing particulates and Correct. they're really good at i mean the smaller size like the probably that point three micron and larger yeah i mean so it's hospitals stuff like that more critical care facilities typically have those yeah and i would caution that you know uh, when when you are looking for uh hepa filter systems you want to look at the fine print and say you know, it may say like ninety nine point nine seven percent effective, but what, at what micron level? Yeah. Right. So you want to be a little cautious on that. I'm not. Sh- I've not seen the study on that, or you know, like many f- and manufacturer manufacturer directly publish that data when they're selling it, maybe on Walmart.com or Amazon.com. But uh, that does happen. Mm-hmm. So you want to you want to look at that and not just pick up a filter that's only. 99.9% effective from 3 to 10 microns, then it might as well not even bother with that. Yeah. You know, because then your face masks are enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, even outdoors. <laughs> uh, so that was one measure. Second measure is uh, ionizers. So, um, Joe, you want to touch base on that a little bit? I'll do a little bit. I will say I'm not as familiar with ionizers as other uh, devices, 
my understanding is one thing that they do, I guess they ionize air, I think they kind of charge the air so it can basically your other particles, your virus will attract, be attracted to these ionized particles. There'll be kind of a larger shape and they can like fall out of the air. They can come around and vacuum them up and clean it. I think it, that's my understanding of them. I think there's a lot more to it. So but I've I I think uh, I'm I'm gonna make a fool out of myself because somebody's gonna say you're wrong. But I'm just going off a of memory here. I think the ionizer is something that breaks down the oxygen molecules, breaks them. So from O2, it separates them separate. So you have O and O. Mm-hmm. And one of the applications that I'm familiar with is they call these uh, order eliminating ionizers that you can purchase for as little as $100 uh, that are used in like confined spaces or like say autom- automobiles. If you have a car that has been smoked in for years, you everybody who has ever bought a car that was a smoker's car would know that the odor is impossible to get rid of. However, there's one way to do do that, and is to in- introduce the ionizer in the car, and let it run for 24 hours, and then uh, turn it off, and then ventilate it for a few hours before you get in. Only caution with that is you're not supposed to be in within the vicinity of an ionizer. So I think it works maybe a little different, uh, but uh, there is that application for it. So Ashray um, did mention it in their publications. They didn't sort of like endorse it. They didn't say, "Yeah, this is a great." This is yeah. People use this is one of the things that people can use, but they they caution and it says that when you're looking at ionizers, uh, uh, because it has not been tested by you know any approved study that Ashray could recommend, they says that you want to be looking at a third party studies to say that well, yes, this particular piece of device offered by such and such manufacturer has third party testing. Uh, that does not have a. That's not what Astra said, but I'm saying it is that they don't. As long as they don't have a, you know, a conflict of interest in it, um, then I think then you, yeah. So do your due diligence to before you buy an ionizer. Yeah, I think there are. I know there's like a UL, which is what the Underwriters Laboratory. They have some listing for ionizers that. Uh, I guess is they they do not produce harmful amounts of ozone or they do not leak harmful amounts of ozone into the space. Okay, that's good. I think there's a equivalent European rating as well. Oh, good. Okay. So ionizers is the second option after HEPA filters. And then the third one is ultraviolet. Oh, yeah. Germicidal. What is it called? I, I'm just going to bug me. I'm going to look it Disinfection? up. Disinfection? UVGI stands for germicidal. Oh, irradiation. Uh, irradiation. I knew that. Sneaky. Ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. Um, and in our last podcast with uh, in architecture, we mentioned uh, certain caution things with them. Uh, one is that they're only effective if they are paired with uh, proper air movement. Mm-hmm. So if they're installed up in the room, first of all, you, it, they're harmful to humans' eye. So you don't want to see be seeing them, um, and and that's just a room application. They can also be installed in air handlers. And let's get back to that. Remind me, Joe, before I, before I forget, because I can go on a tangent and forget about things. Uh, UVGI is install if it's installed up in the room, so it's not in the eye set. You need some sort of fan to bring the air down, so air is sort of circulating up and down throughout the room from ceiling to the floor. Mm-hmm. So that the air, not the UVGI, is not just treating the air that's you know up up by the ceiling all the time. That'd be the purest air if you don't have a fan, <laughs> yeah. right? Or or an air that's moving like from a diffuser that's yeah. located in the ceiling, and then it's the air return air that's picked up at the lower level, right, five feet or lower, mm-hmm. right? So then air is moving down, and then it would keep the air moving through the room, and then UVGI would be effective. Otherwise, it's only twenty percent effective. They say. So if you want it to be 80% effective, then you want the air to move from top to down. It's almost just like you want to walk around with a big snorkel so you can siphon off that clean air up top. Yes. For 
uh, mold control, for uh, you know microbial growth, uh, and even some viral control. It is a good idea. It is an excellent idea to it, to integrate UVGI lighting system downstream of your cooling coil in your air handling system. Mm -hmm. That would uh, because when the cooling coil is something, and without getting into too much technical details, it gets saturated. It means the air that leaves through that is 100% moist. It has, uh, it's 100% water almost. Let's think about it that way. It's hard to explain without showing it on a psychometric, but it's. Let's just say that it's it's when you have humidity levels that are that high, like around 100%. Um, the the microbial growth is very likely, mm -hmm. right? And then that, that moisture clings on to anything downstream, right? It, it's, it lingers around, and if it's, you know, stagnant, then it can turn into moldy spaces, odor, stuff like that. So UVGI that's integrated downstream of uh, a cooling coil in an air handling system does not take a lot of room. Sometimes it can be retrofitted within the existing system, and that's a good way to uh, kill viruses. However, if you're trying to kill viruses that are like s as small as COVID, it's not really going to do the job because it requires, it needs, the viruses has to be exposed to it for a certain amount of time. And I forget exactly what that is. I should know this, but I can't think of it right now. I think it's like half a second or something like that. And so in an air handling unit, it becomes difficult because you need air to move slow. That's rule number one. And you need maybe like two feet of UVGI section where the light's thrown at the air for it to be able to uh, 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 disinfect the virus. So if you don't have room in an air handling system that was already installed and has been there for a few years, it's very likely you're not going to be incorporate that. You can still incorporate UVGIs into ductwork. My experience is that's also as difficult as ha trying to add it in an existing air handler because the velocity of air, the speed of air going through ductwork is not 500 feet per minute anymore. It's thousand feet per minute or two thousand feet per minute some in some instances and that means now that two feet turn into four feet or eight feet and vice versa so the amount of room you need to disinfect air right mm -hmm. uh, and it depends on the speed of the air and the area that you you need to disinfect through upper uh, not UVGI lights not upper um, in an air handling system so it's not as easy to in incorporate. And then one more thing before I ask Joe what I forgot about is the um, the UVGIs are harmful to insulation. They can eat through insulation and filter material. Mm -hmm. So wherever you incorporate that, make sure that it's not uh, directly exposed to um, uh, what is it called, Joe? The uh, UV. Filter. Yeah. yeah, UV. Yeah, it's a in our industry. I mean, it is something. Whenever we do outside equipment or insulation for the exterior we always have to make sure there is a uv protective coating so i mean introducing uv to the inside of your buildings where it's not supposed to see any ultraviolet i mean definitely if it leaks and touches on insulation or plastics and stuff like that it can start to break it down and make it make them weaker probably something i'm sure it's very easy to overlook and not even think about yeah, and if you're ever in a hospital, and I hope that you never have to see an ER room in your life, but if you ever have uh, for yourself or anybody you loved, um, you would find these devices, uh, UVGIs, uh, upper room UVGIs installed in the hospital rooms. Um, if you see like a you know an aqua uh, blue um, light in a room and a small device that's on the corner of the room up by close to the ceiling, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. It's cleaning your room. It's killing viruses. Um, I wonder how many people are going to take their black lights and just uh, try and use those for disinfection. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be as worthwhile. Right. 
Um, so those are those are. Uh, did I miss anything, Joe? In terms of like what else, what other measure you can do to to. Um, uh, I mean, I guess ventilation. We didn't really talk about yeah ventilation, ventilation a whole yeah. lot. Yeah. So I think that I was holding on that on to for our sequences. Okay. So let's just dive right in. Yeah. We're actually running over time now. Uh, so ventilation, ventilation. What what the hell is ventilation? First of all, a lot of people Basically, like me don't understand. Dear, I use think of as as all in reference to the outside air that you get. Correct. I think of clean air also, but for me that's kind of clean outside air that you get to your space. Joe, I get this question a lot. And probably our users are going to be saying the same thing. If you are, say, in Taiwan, or you're in Hong Kong, or you're in New Delhi, India, mm-hmm. or you're in what are the other dirty cities in America? I don't know, Chicago, or New York City. L.A. used to be bad. L.A. Right? Yeah. Air qualities are bad in a lot of these cities. Mm-hmm. And you are right in that right downtown where you're surrounded by the buildings, high rises, and you have an air conditioning system. Right, Mm -hmm. that's I don't know fairly close to the outside street, so there's a lot of dirty air out there. Do you is is that ventilation still good? I get that question all the time. It's definitely not as good as what we have here. So what you would do? Like we have better filtration systems to clean it. Yeah, you would probably do that, and then I think to an extent, especially like the real bad cities, and at certain times, it is probably better just to clean your inside air and just recirculate that than to bring in outside air. I think a lot of them, like you'll see what they call it, like the PM 2.5 and PM 10, which is I think just like particulate matter of that 2.5 microns or 10 microns and larger, which I believe gets a lot of your like emissions from different engines and stuff. It gets your pollen, all that stuff gets wrapped up in it. So obviously cities, if you have a lot of people driving around and stuff like that, the exhaust, I mean, it is particulates that's in the air. So that's where it gets more, I guess, smog and high levels. There are websites, too, that track this kind of stuff, and you can get air quality reports for the different areas. So you would be able to kind of get a heads up if your city's bad today, if it's good, the different levels. Yeah, so to get to those reports, you're going to have to hire Joe to do that study for you. <laughs> yep. We can't really get into the details of that. But um, uh, so ventilation, again, Joe, is, is bringing in outside air. Mm-hmm. And codes now require that you do need to bring in outside air into your rooms, regardless of where your building may be. Uh, and this is only applicable to uh, commercial. Yes. Right. Uh, or industrial or in between, not residential per se. Mm-hmm. And there is a variation that says that if you have a building that has operable windows, for example, and as long as those operable windows, the size of those operable windows is 6% of your square footage of your room, then you're allowed to skip ventilation. We don't recommend that because in the winter, especially in the northeast, you have a problem. Uh, uh, You know, how can you open the window in the dead of the winter? Right. And and we don't recommend that further down south or even Midwest for that matter because in summer months, say south, it's hot and humid. So you're bringing in humid air that's not, you know, healthy. Mm-hmm. Even here it gets, I mean, we hot have and humid. July, right. you know, 90s. I can't imagine if we had operable windows and that's it. Correct. Plus be... pollen is another issue. Like you open the window, pollen is coming in. A lot of people have allergies now, right? And yeah. dust is coming in. You don't see it, but it's coming, mm-hmm. right? So that's why we recommend having a, a air conditioning system in the building so that you don't have to deal with that. Um, so Asher says that improve your ventilation air, outside air uh, ratios. If you can in- bring in more fresh air for a longer period of times, that's one recommendation. Correct, Joe? Yeah. Yep. So one of the things they say, you can kind of purge the building or flush it out before occupancy and then flush it out again after occupancy. And they say that uh, for at least two hours before the building starts to occupy, so if your office opens at 8 o'clock in the morning, then you want to be able to start your systems, Mm -hmm. get them up to speed two hours before that, 
And if you're leaving your office at five o'clock or six o'clock, you want to keep them running for another two hours. Yeah. Uh, so that they clean up the air pretty good. Yeah. Right? And 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 not just on a minimum. They they want to be. The other thing is, Joe. What they they just they just so now we're in the controls, right? The other two, one of the measures is that they don't want you to do what demand control, ventilation, and uh, occupancy control. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? The demand control ventilation is when your system, like your room has a carbon dioxide sensor and you can adjust your airflow to that space to maintain a preset limit of carbon dioxide. The reason people do it is if you have like a conference room that may be, or classroom is designed for 30 people, but you only have 10 people in there, you do not need as much ventilation air to still maintain the same air quality. So you will reduce that outside air component to save energy and see that's the main point of it so you disable your demand control ventilation you no longer reduce your outside air that's right and some buildings especially uh you know buildings within the last 15 20 years may also have uh, uh integrated uh occupancy control or lighting control so when nobody's in the room um, there's an occupancy sensor that might be or might not be integrated with the lighting control system and it would sense nobody is in the room, and it would back off. It won't necessarily turn it off as long as if the building is uh, programmed that you know between eight and five o'clock, it's gotta go to minimum, not shut off. So that system will back off. So if it was supplying say 100 cubic feet per minute, this is I would say 1,000 cubic feet per minute, it may back off to say 300 cubic feet per minute, and that's significant uh, reduction. You know, because those are sized per occupancy, the type of use, and so forth. So that also means that the amount of fresh air that's coming into that room is also reduced. Mm-hmm. So what Asher is saying is that you want to disable your uh, occupancy based as well, because you don't. You may have both combination of both. You may have CO two control that that we Joe just described, uh, demand control ventilation system. Mm-hmm. And you also have integration of, because some, sometimes you have offices, right? Like one or two people offices, you're not going to see a CO2 sensor in them. You're only going to see them in like a common spaces like lobbies, conference rooms, classrooms. You're not going to see them in, uh, you know, uh, uh, office spaces as the, as much. So those are sometimes controlled with, um, uh, you know, oc- occupancy, occupancy sensors, and you you don't you want to disable that so the air is never reduced down to. Uh, so so w- in the beginning we mentioned Joe variable air volume, and that's what that meant. Variable air volume means that the air ramps up and down based on. Excuse me, based on how much uh, ventilation air outside air. A space may need at times, and it also depends on the temperature in the room. Mm-hmm. So if the temperature is, say, cold or hot, uh, air is going to ramp up as designed to be able to cool or he- or heat the space. And when the temp- thermostat has reached its desired set point, for example, summer, it could be 75 degrees or 70 degrees in some offices. Yeah. All right, and then in the winter, it could be 70 degrees as well. So when the rooms reach 70%, the, the system will back off. Won't necessarily shut off. Uh, hydronic system will shut off, but the air system will not shut off because it's still got to bring fresh air at all times. So it'll back off. So you, so uh, so Asher is saying don't do that anymore. It's just keep bringing in the full thing. But you have to understand when you do that, it's costly. Yeah. They're kind of saying, I guess you put your health before your energy, in a sense. Yeah. So the longer you're going to run the system. Yeah. What is that going to do? It's just more money. It's more money. Because they're, say, if you're in the summer and your cooling is provided by a chiller, I know people are going to say, what the hell is a chiller? Because a lot of our audience may not be HVAC savvy. So whatever it is, right, just bear with us. Chiller is something that cools that provides cooling that can be delivered to building and air handlers that allows us to cool the building, right? It could also be a <clears throat> water-based, air-based, um, uh, not air, uh, refrigerant-based mm-hmm. chiller. And um, so if that's going to run constantly at high speed, right, um, that's going to cost you more money. Yep. 
if uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna start to overcool spaces because some spaces would want more cooling, some spaces will not want cooling at all because were the thermostats already met. Then you're gonna have to run your boilers to do reheat to be able to maintain that room, mm-hmm. right? And then that's gonna cost you some money. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely to make it more healthy and also more comfortable. It's yes, it's a game you gotta play. Yes, but I guess that's it. I mean, better healthy environment and better occupant health you know i guess it's in a sense it's a good way to go not to mention more comfortable workers will be more productive for people plus if they have kind of a peace of mind that their buildings are safe you know they will hopefully be probably more relaxed more focused on their work instead of worrying if they're going to catch something from their neighbor that's right uh, we did mention this in the previous podcast with uh, an architecture. We want to reiterate that. And space. So Astra says that maintain space temperatures uh, between 68 to 78 degrees max. Uh, and these are for occupiable spaces, not necessarily storage rooms or you know electrical rooms or IT, telecom, data uh, rooms and things like that. But to where, whatever you have occupants, you don't want to be um, you know, uh, any beyond that. And more importantly, you want to be able to, ma- you should be able to, at least in the summer, you want to be able to maintain relative humidity between 40% to 60%. I know a lot of people will not know what that is, and that's okay. But that's where you hire a mechanical engineer to do your analysis for you. Yep. But just know that we, that humans perform better uh, between 40 to 60%. Uh, 40 to 60% is also, it does not allow microbial growth and or um you know vir- spread of it 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 helps uh reduce the risk of viral and bacterial mit- mitigation so that's also an important factor to know so asher recommends that is that you want to be able to maintain 40 to 60% relative humidity that's not possible in northeast in winter because it gets really dry here uh, so there are some caveats to that we did discuss that in a previous podcast listen to that please and it will you'll get up to speed on that. And please send us a note. Send us an email. Um, call us for interviews. We'll be happy to, to discuss this in more details. Um, but time doesn't allow to talk everything <laughs> in this podcast. Uh, what else, Joe? Definitely questions are always welcome. Uh, there is... Let me see here. Um, Do, one thing that you... Hmm, water. So water oh, system yeah. precautions. I think I want to touch on that real, real quick because Astra is not just talking about air systems. It's also talking about water, uh, domestic water, for example, right? People, the building has been closed for, I don't know. Uh, half a year by now. Half a year, yeah. right? And all the taps have been closed, vents have been closed, everything's been closed. So now, with drinking water, what do they need to do? Oh, hold on a second. You basically want to flush out your system. One of the main bacteria that I would say is the most popular one is Legionella, which causes Legionnaire's disease. Mm. And it's just, I think, created by stagnant water, basically. That's not, it's in like a, I don't know, 70, 90, 110 temp range and not really moving. Yeah. So you can, I mean, before you occupy your building, I believe more or less you would flush out your whole system, open up all of your taps, run it to just basically do a, a water change try to replace the entire volume of water at least getting it all circulating and moving around getting your water heaters maybe turn it up a little bit high and get it cleaned out as well kill any bacteria that are in your system and then flush it out down the drain yeah good point um i just want to uh, because one of the papers that Astro published is called guide guidance for uh, reopening of schools is one page document that you can download from ashrae.org. Um, uh, and it ta- and the underwater precaution is also saying that, uh, I'm not too familiar with these, but it's, uh, you know you can read that. It's and We're gonna link this page so you can look that up uh, under uh, under our show notes. Uh, utilize Astra Standard 188 and Guideline 12 can help minimize the risk of waterborne bo- pathogens such as uh, Legionella. Legionella. Did I say it right, Joe? Legionella. Uh, as far as I know, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, do that, um, and that would help you, you know, reduce some of that risk. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I think one other thing would be 
I have two things. Uh, exhaust, like toilet exhaust, stuff like that. Hmm. A lot of, yeah, I, mean, I think it's very common to have your bathroom exhaust just operate either based on occupancy when, you know, you have a sensor that knows someone's in there, your light turns on, your exhaust fan turns on, and then after you leave, it might turn off or it might run for five, ten minutes and then turn off. So I would I think you could look at either extending that run time so it runs for, I don't know, maybe half an hour or just make it a continuous exhaust while your building's occupied. So if your air handling system turns on, your bathroom exhaust fans also turn on and just run during occupancy. I think not only will your bathroom smell less bad because you're kind of continuously exhausting any odors that accumulate, but you're also kind of bringing in fresh air either from your space adjacent or something like that. But you keep that air movement going. Yeah. Yeah, so air change rates are important in spaces like that. Um, uh, and and oftentimes, you know, a lot of time, because you, you're not, by code, not required to dump fresh air in directly into the bathroom, you can use the air that was dumped in an adjacent space, like a corridor or, you know, adjacent any type of room as long as, you know, it's it was fresh air. You can transfer that air into the bathroom uh, as a makeup air, then it's exhausted out of the bathroom to uh, to be able to maintain a healthy negative uh, airflow rate so that it can take order and things like that out of the bathroom. So very, very good point, Joe. That's uh, That brings up, that's not, that actually uh, brings up another important thing that I kind of wanted to, uh, to almost forgot actually. So dedicated to outside air systems or even if a system that is capable, that was not you know, designed for dedicated outside air systems, but it's set to, uh, you know, and especially in conditions like today where the temperatures are dropping and they're not too hot, so you can turn them into, like, you know, economizer mode. And by the way, economizer mode is when you, your system is um, just going to bring bring in 100% outside air into the building and it's going to exhaust all that air back out. Mm-hmm. Um and it can only happen in swing seasons, uh, not necessarily dead of the winter or a winter period when temperatures are below 55 degrees or so, 50 degrees or so, 55, I, th- I suppose. And um, and they're hotter than 65 or something like that, 70, 70, let's just say 70 for shits and giggles, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so in those instances, you want some maintenance, you want some inspection happening. You want your IT, I mean, sorry, not IT, your your HVAC guys or engineers to, or, you know, a tab contractor to get out there and make sure that the, your recirc dampers, if you have one in your air handlings, are completely shut or they're operating properly as designed. So if, if the system wants them to open, they open. If the system wants to close, they're completely closing. So you're not getting any mix mixing, um, you know, between the outside air and the return air. So that's that's an important aspect of it. And ASHRAE is also American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning uh, uh, for engineers. Also states that you you want maintenance on these things, right? You want a schedule that someone is constantly looking at these things and changing filters when they need to, and making sure the dampers are operating and everything is operating, and the air quality is good. You know, monitoring the CO two sensors where they are. Um, make, making sure everything is working fine, mm-hmm. all the dampers are opening and closing, right? Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. You almost want to have that whole system reevaluated. I mean, that's kind of the unfortunate thing with some maintenance. They might focus on fixing that issue at hand, while in the long run they could be doing something that is more detrimental to the overall building, and. They might not even know it. They might not realize it for years to come. So I think just reevaluating it, making sure everything is operating as it was intended to, just that alone can have a pretty big impact. Um, uh, and I've, I, I think this is probably my last point, Joe. I don't know how much more we want to go into this, but one of the things that, you know, if you're thinking about new buildings, you kind of want to talk to your, your design engineers and, you know, uh, have... Future plans for pandemics or plandemics. <laughs> pandemics? <laughs> Did That's I just squeeze it right in there? The p- uh, for, for your for your plandemics. <laughs> Sorry. That's just a joke. Um, see, I told you we blow hot air. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for your pandemics, you want to have in your sequences. Sequence of operation is something that 
is automated throughout the modern buildings today. You have, um, you know, pre-programmed uh, sequences programmed into a circuit board and then inside a computer or linked to a computer that allows your building to automatically operate. It's air handling systems and all the other, uh, you know, building systems, hospital systems, whatever it is out there automatically lighting systems automatically so they turn on automatically they turn off automatically they ramp up automatically they ramp down automatically and what you what what you want to be able to do that is is uh you know you you, in, you can incorporate a uh, few things in there and you want either you want to get the you know hvc guys to rewrite your sequence for the pandemic mode what to do uh, and then you want to bring in a tab contractor or a commissioning agent and or commissioning agent to get your building up to speed on that. So that those are the some things that you would need to do in order for your get to get your building ready. Hire an engineer, hire commissioning agents to do all this stuff for you. And in future, when you're designing new buildings, you want to be asking the same questions to your design team. This is what happens in the pandemic mode. How can we size this piece of equipment you're going to pay for it believe me it's not going to be cheap uh i think nobody is worried about energy anymore as much as they are worried about the health right life's more important i suppose right yep. so so i think that people are starting especially in public spaces right where you're 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 responsible i mean arguably you're responsible for other people's health arguably um uh i have my own opinions about that but we'll discuss that some other time um, but the the what I'm saying is that you want so there is one more measure that you know we HVC engineers are always pushing for that and architects with all due respect you know we love them to death and we they're they're good people they're they're awesome but they just don't understand air and we understand the way we understand air they understand air but not the way we understand air so what I'm saying is that try to now incorporate. As, as a building owner, ask your architect. Yes, it takes a little more square footage from you, but it, it, it is a really good thing to do is to supply air high and return it from the bottom. That's a one very good strategy that you can do to help mitigate the risk of viruses, the risk of any of the contaminants, air, dust, all of that. Mm -hmm. Supply air high, return it at the bottom, closer to the ground. And what that does is not only increases the effective effectiveness of your um, heating systems, especially cooling, cool air dumps, that's given. Heating, not so much. So it improves that, but it also improves the air quality and and so forth. Uh, this the other thing that you want to be you want them to you know think about is uh, so high supply, low return, and then one of the more important things that I want to talk about is. Last thing I said the last thing the last time, but no, this is it. Uh, demand control. I'm sorry. Um, uh, displacement ventilation systems. Do, Joe, you want to talk a little bit about the displacement ventilation? Sure. So with the displacement ventilation system. One of the ideas is that you are basically displacing the hot air to the top of the ceiling. You would typically introduce kind of slightly cooler than room air, maybe. 60 65 into the space low and at a very slow velocity what that does it kind of more or less keeps close to the floor it will find a heat source and it creates a plume like a person or something like that so when it finds that heat source the hot air rises up and it kind of just cools you off with a relatively room neutral temperature but then all of that hot air brings any your breath any kind of stuff you're exhaling up to your ceiling space up high where it is returned it also kind of stratifies i guess one of the goals is that you have a stratified air where you're basically your occupant space your breathing zone is one temperature then your up high ceiling space is a hotter temperature since you're not hopefully returning too much of the hot air you keep that stratification yeah, the, and and these systems are uh, uh, by far more, com you know, most comfortable systems that you would find when it comes to cooling, because you won't feel the, feel the draft. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, most air, you know how like sometimes you have the the air systems and they the, they turn air into too dry or drafty. The displacement ventilation systems don't do that. Is only because the amount of ve the velocity of air is so low. It's like if you ever if you ever have a chance go to price industries website 
Look at their displacement ventilation diffusers, and they have videos of how air moves. It's a smoke test that essentially just shows that concept that the air comes out of diffuser, usually located on the side walls, even on the gr uh, even on the floor, uh, and it comes out and it hugs the floor three four inches above the floor until it finds a thermal plume, a thermal source. It could be a human, it could be a light lamp, it could be any of those things. It could be a speaker for that because you know speakers get hot, right? Mm -hmm. And it's going to start rising around them. It is actually astonishing if you if you locate like a table in a way, right? Like a or a, or a bookshelf, place it right in the middle of the room. It's amazing that the air would hug around the entire table, go on top of the I mean uh, uh, the 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 uh, the bookshelf, and it'll come back down. Hmm. Like it's amazing how the air moves. It's just so magical. It's just it's just, it's mechanical porn essentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it when it's when once it's it finds its uh, uh thermal source then it becomes a thermal plume and then it just rises straight up so you're not so whoever's got the contaminants or whatever it's not going all around the room before it gets picked up by a diffuser it's going straight up and then you only have to treat for six six and a half feet of the room condition and you don't have to condition the ceiling above that mm -hmm. that's another beauty of that uh you you know so it it, it has a lot of advantages um uh when it comes to this type of thinking so uh heating is a little problem because when you uh supply hot air that low uh it becomes it 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 doesn't do the thermal flume it just starts to rise right away so it's not a perfect fit for heating but f to do that you kind of incorporate like a hydronic heat system of some sort even for interior spaces you do like an overhead supply sometimes or you have like radiant heat radiant heat is probably the best substitute with um uh or ad not substitute but addition to displacement ventilation cooling systems it's a little more complex it's a little more you know but it's the most it's if you really want to get this right that's the approach that you want to be looking at so hvac engineers should be you should be asking them because usually it's not something that they would or people would think right away because it's you know it's complex it requires more uh you know f uh thinking and more shaft spaces maybe under floor spaces uh you know it's a little complex but it, it we've done it a million times it's a very common thing to do in theaters and you know uh auditoriums mm -hmm. right uh music musical spaces it makes perfect sense there because you your noise is a concern draft is a concern too many people right and if you size it right um uh, the most comfortable system there is because yeah. you know, and then for example, like for theaters, right? Theaters, there are curtains and and stuff that's hanging off the walls, and if you have an overhead system, it'll move the curtains. It'll, you know, all kinds of different uh, uh, parameters. I don't want to get into the details of of how to size or how to design that system. What I'm saying is, it, it, it's something to think about for future uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. um, any uh, parting words, there Joe? Is I mean, I, yeah, I have a couple, two things I'd like to touch on. I mean, one, in general, my take on this is as, I guess, HVAC engineers, the, our job in part is to make the your built environment, your interior, your buildings, healthy buildings, comfortable for occupants. A lot of that comes down to ventilation and fresh air, maintaining good thermal comfort, which is adequate temperatures and humidity. What that helps to do, it puts I mean, less stress on the body, the less stress on your body, the healthier you are, the better your immune system is to fight anything. And as far as like the dry air, I mean, in the winter, if you, I don't know, if you can like walk around your office, and gather enough static to so shock someone, your building is probably too dry. Or if you get a lot of like boogers or if your skin is really dry, I think that would be a symptom. It would show you that you're building is just too dry not much you can do then another one it was uh june of this year the government accountability office put out a study that they did i think in 2019 on the state of schools and this was mostly i would say all public schools they did briefly touch on charter schools but that's besides the point what they found was that a lot of the schools were more or less they needed they need improvements they're not in good shape i want to say it was a little less than half of the school districts had buildings where their hvac systems 
needed improvements. I didn't really go into detail on what that meant, if they were inadequate or something like that. It just said they needed improvement. So that kind of gives me the impression that, I mean, in general, you know, there's a lot of buildings out there that people are going into where they might not be set up to create like the optimal, healthy indoor environment. That's just, I think, I hope that our podcast today gave people information to get started, to ask the questions. To, I mean, if you're going into a building, you might as well try to make it as good as you can be and have the people that own it at least hopefully take some interest and do what they can to make it healthy. Yeah, and, uh, and, and just to add on to that is that when you are looking for solutions to your building and your you know, HVAC things, you may not know what, the, what to ask and how to go by it. And, you know, you're also, if you're working with someone new, some new engineering firm, uh, or you've never worked with them before, you know, they may... Uh, lead you in one direction or the other based on their analysis, but it's also good to have a third-party uh, HVAC uh, consultant, uh, such as Joe Green here, uh, who who can be a peer review guy. So it's always a good idea if you can to you know for a little bit more money hire uh, an HVAC engineer who can do a peer review to whatever it is that your campus is implementing. Uh, through another engineering firm, and that sort of helps you as a building owner to ask the right questions and implement, you know, additional safeties if you can implement them and so forth. So it gets everybody on their feet, and um, and it's a win and w- win win for everyone. Yep. Right? Uh, anything else, Joe? Before I, you don't. Uh, last of the minute. I mean, I know sometimes we would try to do gadgets. Yes. I, I didn't think of anything specific, but there is one, it's not a new gadget at all, one gadget I'm thinking about getting, and this is, one well, of my friends has it, is a like foot and calf massager. So I, I might, I'm starting to look around at that, I'm hopefully in the next I don't know, couple of weeks I'm going to purchase one. I'm just thinking it'll be a very nice after work or after hiking just sit down, hit a button, and get your feet and calves massaged. That's pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Go. Cool. So the second um, gadget for the, today's podcast, I've got one. You want to tell everybody what that is, Joe? Yeah, I do. It's a really cool device. It is Bird, B-I-R-D, by M-U-V Interactive. It is a device that attaches to your finger and it lets you control your computer. I mean, basically a mouse that attaches to your finger and it can tell where your finger is in space and the, how you move it, how it twists and turns. And you can use that to control your computer. You can essentially use this gadget, uh, in multiple ways. You can turn a wall into a screen. Uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, not only it turns, you know, screen it in, into an inter- interactive screen. You can you know, zoom in and out of that on a wall or on a TV monitor or a computer monitor uh, with the with your gesture of your finger, and it you can rotate it around. So if you have like floor plan, like an architectural floor plan that was three dimensional, or you had a model of three three D 3D something, mm-hmm. you can rotate it around, spin it around, orbit around uh, around it. Um, those of no, those of uh, uh, those of who are familiar with, um, you know, 3D stuff on the internet can understand that better. Uh, but for presentations as well, if you're, you know, doing a presentation, uh, it's not a clicker. You can just kind of like do the side, you know, like motion view, and it will flip pages, right? Yeah. Um, stuff like that, and it's an incredible um, gadget for a very, very reasonable price. Um, so for offices or, you know, like entrepreneurs, I think that's a hell of a thing to, you would dazzle your audience. That's for sure. If you're presenting and you start waving your finger around to control your computer, like you said, I mean, any, any 3d display, you know, instead of clicking and dragging and stuff like that, you just take your finger, you can swirl around. There was one video on their website where they show someone controlling a drone with their finger finger wow yeah Yeah. uh 
I saw them someone you know rotating like a uh, or maybe was, maybe she was making like floor plans. It almost looked like a th- you know 3D SketchUp type of thing, and she was moving a, a furniture within the floor plan. Yeah, which is pretty incredible. It's kind of like a aid to a VR. Yeah, if you will, you know VR you put the headsets, but this is no headset. It's just your finger, which is incredible, man. Yeah, it's like amazing where technology is going and i want all these gadgets this looks really i mean like you said the price was 120 dollars right now you know what i'm uh, thinking joe i'm hoping that there is like a, a, a um um what do you call that uh affiliate link so i can plug it in yep. and maybe maybe our our hardcore listeners will support our show so yeah <laughs> buy a little cool gadget and yeah see what make what use you can do with it yeah man mm-hmm. there you go all right well that's it for the gadgets today all right so hopefully the next podcast, which is actually going to be a really awesome one, actually the next two, three that we've planned, uh, stay tuned. You're going to love them because uh, some of them are controversial, not COVID-related at all, uh, and and some like really cool stuff that we want to talk about. And uh, as soon as we can uh, publish them, we'll give you an update. Uh, please make sure that you stay in touch with us. Send us an uh, email. Uh, I would actually prefer that you send us, uh, join us on our uh a telegram group that Joe doesn't even know about. <laughs> uh, we will throw in a link on a telegram uh, chat group that actually it's likely to have all our friends over there and we can, uh, we, we're going to, you know, we're, we're hoping that we start that and, and all the cool kids are talking and stuff in there. Um, so I want to be able to, um, uh, for you to be able to reach us uh, for any of the questions that you may have and we'll be able to, you know, uh, chime in on that and um, lastly i'd like you to uh visit our website as often as you can and uh we have a donate page now yep give us your money please yeah a little bit yep i don't we don't want a lot but whatever you can that would be helpful uh, so we can keep bringing these podcasts and we appreciate your uh participation your listening and all that and um uh, use our links we're going to be uh starting to do some um uh you know, things that you may be uh, looking to purchase, so whether they be gadgets or, or um, filtration systems. So if you buy it through our links, that, is, that supports the show. And uh, really help. We, we really appreciate your, uh, your support. Mm-hmm. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Please subscribe to us via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Music, and YouTube. And visit us on engineering.tech. This was Engineering Tech Show.